Thank you very much, Senator, for talking to the Voice of America. Thanks for having me. Uh, a recent Fox News poll indicates that people in the United States, Americans, are divided in their support or um, for not accepting the Iran nuclear deal. And there are about 26 percent also who don't have an opinion. Um, what's your take on this? Unfortunately, this issue has been a very divisive political issue in this country, as many things are. Uh, so Republicans have fought very hard against the Iran nuclear agreement, and thus there are a lot of their supporters around the country who, you know, maybe not have not devoted deep thought to the issue uh, that line up w with their partisan identification. Um, the fact of the matter is, Republicans and Democrats both admit that the deal is working, that there has been no material breach by the Iranians or by the United States, and uh, what it sought to achieve, which is to stop Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and ending the nuclear weapons program to the extent that it existed, um, has been successful. So uh, this is a political issue. It's always been a partisan issue, but uh, nobody can say that the deal as it was structured isn't working. Yes. There are news reports indicating that uh, President Trump this time might not, might not approve or, uh, the, or certify Iran's compliance with the nuclear deal. And you just mentioned that the deal is working. What other arguments do you have to convince others that the deal is working? You're a supporter of the deal, obviously. Right. I think it's important to note that uh, um, President Trump is not likely to uh, find that Iran is not in compliance. Uh, he, he is likely to do something called decertification that is related to his broader objections with the agreement, but he's not likely going to say that Iran is not complying because he can't. Uh, all of the experts know and tell him that Iran is complying. Um, I, you know, the pitch that I make to my constituents is that um, given how much focus there is on North Korea's uh, very fast path, uh, that they are on to a nuclear weapon that could hit the United States. Why on earth would we want to have two countries pursuing nuclear weapons that are traditionally adversarial to U.S. security interests? Uh, North Korea is closer than ever to having a nuclear weapon that could hit the United States, and we shouldn't uh, back out of an agreement that would allow Iran to get back on a path to a nuclear weapon as well. This is not in the U.S. national security interest uh, to make our life even harder when it comes to nuclear nonproliferation. Several European ambassadors were here on the Hill, and they were trying to make their case to preserve the deal. Do you think that their arguments were persuasive enough? I hope their agreements are persuasive. Uh, they were very persuasive when Congress was voting on this agreement uh, several years ago. Uh, the fantasy that the president and his uh, advisors try to construct is that if the United States pulled out of this agreement and reapplied sanctions, that the Europeans would do the same. And the Europeans are telling us definitively they will not. Uh, that if Iran is complying with the deal, they will stay in the deal and they will continue to grant sanctions relief to Iran. If that's the case, then there's no reason that the Iranians would come back to the negotiating table because they would um, still be getting enough sanctions relief from European countries uh, to, um, to, 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 to stay away from a set of new negotiations. So I think these conversations that Europeans are having are persuasive. Now, another thing that the critics of the deal are um, telling Europeans and warning them is about doing business with Iran. And in Connecticut, for instance, there is a, a law prohibiting state um, investments in doing business with Iran, especially in the energy um, sector. Do you think that there's a risk uh, to do business with Iran? I certainly think there's a risk to do business with Iran. Iran is a supporter of uh, terrorism in the region. Iran is uh, running a ballistic missile program that ultimately could threaten uh, some of our most sacred allies. There are a set of non-nuclear sanctions that still apply uh, to businesses that are doing um, work in Iran. So if you are a U.S. business, you should be very careful about doing business uh, in Iran because even though the nuclear sanctions have been taken down, there are a host of non-nuclear sanctions for Iran's other deleterious behavior in the region that still apply. You mentioned Iran's uh, ballistic uh, program, missile ballistic programs, and it seems that they are still continuing. They haven't stopped that. What could be done realistically to deal with that? 
Well, I think we compound this problem in the United States. Uh, Iran's ballistic missiles, though they could pose a threat to Israel, um, are primarily pointed at Saudi Arabia. Um, there is a contest, as everyone knows, between the Saudis and the Iranians for regional supremacy. And when the United States continues to sell record numbers of arms to the Saudis, it does not quell Iran's interest in building up its own ballistic missile program. So we regularly and rightly complain about Iran's ballistic missile program, in part because there certainly is a threat to Israel. But then we increase the rationale that Iran has to continue to build that program by selling so many weapons to the Saudis. We should stop this arms race in the region that is fueled in part by the United States. Now, I certainly supported and will continue to support sanctions against the Iranians for a ballistic missile program that is in violation of UN resolution. Uh, but I understand that you've got to have a much more comprehensive strategy if you want to stop Iran from building and continue to advance this program. It's not just sanctions. It's thinking about how your actions in other parts of the region um, complicate your goal of stopping the ballistic missile program. Uh, what about Iran's uh, posture in the Middle East region? Some of the critics of the deal are saying that, especially after the signing of the deal, Iran has distinctly been very assertive in its posture in the Middle East. What do you think would be done about that? And should the United States be concerned? Well, listen, I think the United States should be concerned, but I think we should also be concerned about the role of uh, other actors in the region. Um, I have been a longtime critic of the way in which Iran operates, its support for groups like Hezbollah, um, its uh, support for despotic regimes like that of Bashar al-Assad. But I've also been very critical of the Saudis who are exporting uh, a brand of Islam that forms the building blocks of Sunni extremism all around the world. And so from my perspective, the United States has to be very tough on Iran, but we also have to be very tough on the Saudis. And frankly, we have to be careful not to get in the middle of a set of proxy wars playing out in places like Yemen and uh, Syria that ultimately aren't in our interests to become enmeshed inside. Now, I want to talk to you, if I may, about Iran's violation of human rights. Some of the um, critics or skeptics of the Iran nuclear deal are saying that this issue has been put on the back burner because they want to preserve the deal. Do you think this is the case? Well, the nuclear agreement is about Iran's nuclear weapons program, period, stop. Um, Iran engages in all sorts of other malevolent behavior. But this agreement was not about anything other than preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon because uh, we thought that their human rights behavior, their support for terrorism, their ballistic missile program would all be much more menacing uh, if Iran was also a nuclear weapons country. So uh, we did not set aside uh, our concerns or the international community's concerns about all of the other bad things that Iran does. We simply thought it was important to take the question of Iran's nuclear weapons program off the table. You don't think in hindsight that this should have been brought up also, the issue of human rights? Uh, it, it, it would have made a nuclear deal impossible. Um, had we put on the table all of our other issues with Iran, we would have never gotten a deal on the question of their nuclear weapons program. And now as we watch what's happening in North Korea, um, it should make us even more confident that what we did in Iran was the right thing to uh, narrow our focus on Iran's nuclear weapons program to make sure that they never get to the point that North Korea is today. Now again, talking about Iran's human rights violations, what do you think of what's happening with U.S. citizens in Iran who are being detained on bogus charges? Yeah, it's an abomination and in every level of government we need to raise this question with the Iranians and demand that U.S. citizens that are being falsely detained or imprisoned, U.S. citizens that have gone missing, um, uh, need to uh, come back to the United States. This uh, you know, has been a bipartisan concern. Republicans and Democrats raise this at every, uh, in every way we can. But I will say, as a proponent of engagement with Iran, um, the best path uh, to try to settle these questions of how U.S. citizens are treated inside Iran is to talk to the Iranians. And when we aren't, um, as, as is the case today, by and large, um, we're less likely, not more likely, to get these questions about the disposition of U.S. persons inside Iran uh, dealt with fairly. Who do you think uh, we should talk to in Iran? Because they are so divided. Uh, are we talking about a group that is in power right now, or there are several uh, centers of power? Who would you talk to? 
Well, we, you know, tr we traditionally talk on a government-to-government -government level, so we, as we did rather consistently during the o Obama administration, we should be talking to Rouhani and to Zarif and uh, to the government in charge. Uh, certainly we uh, have lots of person-to-person -person relationships given our wonderfully large uh, Iranian-American population. Those communications and those relationships need to continue. Uh, but, you know, we had a very bad situation uh, when Iranian, uh, the Iranian Navy boarded a U.S. vessel. Um, it could have gone much worse than it did, and the only way it was resolved was because we had an ability for the U.S. Secretary of State to get on the phone with the Iranian Foreign Minister. That ability does not exist today in the way that it did in the Obama administration. And should we have a crisis that occurs between our military and the Iranian military, I'm much less confident today that we'd be able to work it out. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank I you. I appreciate your time. Thank you.